Good morning. My name is Julia Kotman Norton, and on behalf of the team working with our client Greenpeace International, I'm so excited to be here presenting the culmination of our project this semester. Through our client, Greenpeace International, our research and recommendations are intended to guide the organization's Global Climate Action Task Force, a coalition of Greenpeace employees that sets the broader organization's policies on climate change more specifically. This morning, I'll provide background on the problem the project seeks to address, our research methodology to develop strategic recommendations, and what happens next with our project. Our client, Greenpeace International, is based in Amsterdam and is responsible for developing the organization's global strategy for environmental protection and conservation. It also serves as the management branch for the 27 national and regional offices that span 55 countries. For over 40 years, Greenpeace has existed as a direct action, boots on the ground environmental NGO, focusing on energy, nature, and people. However, in recent years, the organization has reframed itself as a leader in environmental policy and technical advisory. While Greenpeace still organizes boots on the ground initiatives, as demonstrated through this picture of a successful 2015 campaign against oil drilling in the Arctic, the Global Climate Action Task Force also takes on scientific and political work. As Greenpeace continues to grow as an organization, our recommendations will help guide this task force's global climate political strategy. As those of us here in the room today know, climate change is a serious threat to our planet, and the impacts are already being felt around the world. And it is evident that if current emissions trajectories persist, greenhouse gas concentrations and global temperatures will continue to rise, potentially triggering devastating tipping points for the Earth's systems. Globally, climate action strikes are occurring as increasing numbers of people are realizing just how dire the situation is and how limited countries' current efforts are in their tangible ability to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. One of these strikes even took place on our campus last month. As shown in this graph, the blue shows warming based on current policies, pledges, and targets regulating emissions, and the green shows the reduction in emissions that would be necessary to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And there's a significant gap between these current trajectories, intended national contributions, and the actual necessary emissions cuts. The main focus of our project was how to resolve this gap, and in order to do so, we looked at whether current national targets and policies will achieve necessary emissions reductions by 2030, what sectors account for the highest quantities of emissions and by how much each of those sectors need to change? And lastly, what policy changes are needed to effectively reduce those emissions? Our team was tasked with identifying countries, sectors, and policies that can best address this climate action gap. To narrow our list of countries, we developed a framework based on greenhouse gas emissions, the Climate Action Tracker Rank, which analyzes how much progress a country is making or expected to make on its Paris Agreement commitments, the UN Human Development Index, which measures life expectancy, standard of living, and education, and projected population growth for 2020 through 2025, which was used as a proxy for projected future emissions. Through this framework, we narrowed this global problem from our long list of 15 countries to a shorter list of seven countries and the EU by looking at the highest ranking countries. Our client restricted this number of countries for us to analyze in order for us to really be able to hone in on the key players and build Greenpeace's global strategy. As shown in this map, the energy sector accounts for the majority of emissions in the EU, China, India, Russia, and the US, and the agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector accounts for the majority of emissions in Brazil, Indonesia, and Nigeria. What's particularly interesting about the top emitting se sectors globally is that generally speaking, the energy sector accounts for the, the majority of emissions in the developed countries that we focused on on our shortlist, and the agriculture and forestry sector accounts for the majority of emissions in the developing countries that we focused on. This divide in global emissions trends was really critical in developing our recommendations. Taking these countries that we identified, we then looked at a number of factors within each country. First, we looked at current national policies and nationally determined contributions that were pledged at the Paris Agreement. Next, we evaluated emissions stemming from the top five emitting sectors. This included energy, transportation, agriculture and forestry, industry, and buildings. Our research approach also included political influence in the international sphere, 
which was determined by looking at a ranking that was produced by the University of Pennsylvania, which looked at political and economic influence, international alliances, leadership roles, and national importance of environmental issues, all of which we determined were important factors in each country's potential to lead the global transformation needed to stay within 1.5 degrees. And finally, we evaluated top trade partners and what types of goods are exported and imported in each country, which can be used as leverage for influencing global change through trade restrictions. Within each country, we explored subnational and national level policy recommendations in depth. Once we completed this individual country research, we then took a step back and we tried to pick out commonalities across each of the seven countries and the EU. And what we found was that first, our recommendations highlight geopolitical strategy, which focuses on how to pull decision makers and stakeholders together. Second, we focused on climate policy advocacy, which looked at how to influence policies, laws, and regulations. And third, we looked at program development and research. And so you can better understand how this process actually translated into strategic policy recommendations, I'll take you through a case study of Brazil. Brazil's highest emissions by far are from the agriculture and forestry sector. Under current President Bolsonaro, progress on emissions reductions is being actively dismantled, as the current administration has expressed support for deforestation in the Amazon and has also indicated an intent to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Given this, we considered how Greenpeace would be able to influence emissions reductions in the face of this political adversity, and we recommend that Greenpeace should identify and focus on states with the highest rates of deforestation and also historically the greatest political sway in order to be able to target both where the problem is occurring and also which actors may be able to actually sway the federal administration. Next, we looked at how Greenpeace could advocate for improved climate policies. One of our recommendations is to demand stricter standards on traded products, which we believe would be able to be used as leverage to incentivize better environmental performance in Brazil. For example, Brazil is one of the top international traders of soybeans. We suggest that if Brazil's international trade partners were to extend the existing moratorium on soybean trade to include more regions of Brazil, this could significantly improve emissions stemming from the agriculture and forestry sector, and this could also be pursued through actions to develop meat and grain moratoriums, which are other crops that are key drivers of deforestation in Brazil, or through advocacy of zero deforestation supply chains. In terms of focusing on program development and research, we recommend investing in R&D focusing on the agriculture and forestry sector. This would include methods to quickly and easily deploy reforestation campaigns, and also agriculture and cultivation methods to minimize emissions impacts from land use change. For example, some countries are working on really exciting and innovative techniques, such as silvopasture, which can be used as a method for natural carbon capture by increasing the absorption rates of healthy soils and minimizing erosion caused by destructive agricultural practices. Similar to these recommendations for Brazil, we tailored recommendations for each of the countries on our list. Taken as a whole, these recommendations form global leverage points for the transformation of climate action. In particular, the implementation of these recommendations may result in a push and pull effect between countries. For example, as more countries such as the US or China adopt climate change as a policy priority, they may in turn push Brazil's politicians to engage more actively in its own climate action efforts. And in turn, Brazil's stricter trade standards may pull other countries with similar economic patterns like Indonesia to adopt comparable trade standards. We then looked at how each of these leverage points can be translated into policy windows in which we find that Greenpeace will be able to have the biggest impact in driving the change that's needed for emissions reductions. For example, within the next two years, Greenpeace may have the ability to impact China's drafting of its next five-year plan, EU elections, or the affordable clean energy rule that has been proposed in the US. In 2021, Greenpeace may consider focusing on Russia's parliamentary elections, and in 2022, we highlight that Brazil's federal and congressional elections and India's target year for renewable energy are crucial times in which Greenpeace can act. So what will our client do with all this information? We'll give our client briefing later this week, and the intention is that the client will present our research to the Global Climate Action Task Force, who would then work with the organization's national and regional offices in these countries to implement the strategic recommendations we've developed and ultimately drive the change that's needed to resolve the climate action gap and limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And with that, I'd like to thank you so much for your attention.
Hi there, great job. Um, so in the Brazil case study, and I'm sure it's because you didn't get the chance to explain it fully to us with your limited amount of time, um, you mentioned demanding stricter standards, so like an expansion of the soybean moratorium and moratorium on other um, agricultural products from Brazil. So I guess my question is like, one, how much of Brazil's agriculture is soybeans? Um, and like, what impact do you foresee this having on the local economies there? So we, because of the breadth of our research, we developed strategic recommendations and didn't really dive in a whole lot within each of those strategic recommendations just because of time constraints. Um, but soybeans are a huge portion of Brazil's uh, agricultural sector. I don't actually know the percentage, um, but it's driven by the demand for um, primarily livestock feed. Um, and so that also encompasses another big portion of their uh, agriculture and cultivation sector. Um, we didn't dive into what that would do for Brazil's economy, but um, I guess the idea is that if R&D is also being developed to um, drive change in the agriculture and forestry sector, that would enable Brazil to continue doing what they're doing, just in different ways. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, this was, I think, our 17th set of final briefings since we created the program. Probably, uh, you know, well, definitely over 80 uh, clients have been served by this workshop since it began. And uh, I think, as you could tell, these were a series of excellent projects, really terrific presentations. And each of them bounded by uh, the client and by the analytic work that we're being asked to do. So very often one of the responses to questions was that was beyond the scope of our study. Well, that's actually the way it works. Uh, we work on these problems a little piece at a time. Uh, you've probably heard me say we're trying to make things less bad. We can't really solve these problems, but we can improve uh, the situation. I was looking at the Greenpeace uh, chart of climate, of, of of uh, CO2 emissions, and anybody looking at that closely sees that the rate of increase has slowed down and that we seem to be actually plateauing a little bit, even though uh, we could do, be doing a better job. That's uh, a, a, an indication of how things work. Uh, so let me do a few things here. First, I want you to join me in thanking your faculty for uh, advising the project. <laughs> I, I want you to thank your groups, which really work well together, and now through three semesters of working together in different kinds of groups, uh, I think you've really done a spectacular job, so I think we should all applaud ourselves. <clears throat> and part of what I, I want you to be thinking about uh, as you leave here today is what did we learn? Um, well, we learned how to work together on complex problems that cut across many, many different fields of study. That you could be a hydrologist and not really understand every aspect of the water problem that you need to understand. You need to understand something about institutions and about communities and about politics and about economics. And so the traditional disciplines uh, need to work together to address these problems. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because we live on a more crowded planet, that the demands on that planet for economic development are growing, uh, and that uh, if we're going to enjoy the kind of lifestyle we lead here, and if the people in the developing world are gonna get to this level of, of consumption, perhaps a different kind of consumption, but this level of consumption, we have to do it by paying attention to all the issues you heard about uh, today. Now, how does this, how is this applied? You know, there's a video we have of one of our alums, uh, and he says, you know, my job is like a series of workshop projects. Uh, and it really is. This is, you know, I've been an environmental professional uh, for over four decades, 
and I've been doing these kinds of projects uh, in my professional practice and you know the just and then in administration in universities and what I find is that they're all time bound we don't get all the information we need we never solve any problems um, if you don't believe me uh, we've been trying to solve the elevator problem in this building <laughs> since the 1980s um, <clears throat> and at the same time, we try to work together uh, to make progress and to learn. Um, workshop is a lot like work, actually. And the kinds of things that you found satisfying and the kind of things you found frustrating, uh, you're going to find uh, when you uh, show up at your jobs uh, after you graduate. And I know that because of the nature of this program, it's so intense, people doing 18 points a semester, uh, it's hard to find the time to do all the networking you need to do to find employment. I want to be uh, very clear that you all will do that. Um, and uh, the record of your predecessors in employment is quite good. Uh, Professor Hill is one of those predecessors, as she can tell you about her colleagues. But in fact, the work that we're doing, the work that you're being equipped to do through the program and through this workshop, is extraordinarily important and in the 17 years since we started all this, uh, actually it's 18 but we have 17, we started a year before we finished, uh, if you know what I mean, um, we uh, have accomplished a great deal and your predecessors have accomplished a great deal. Uh, they are in fact all over the world uh, leading environmental organizations, nearly all of them are still working in, this, in sustainability in one fashion or another. Uh, and so it's really a, it's a, an impressive record and it's a record that really comes from the fact that you self-select to come here. Uh, it's not that we don't have an admissions process because we do and not everybody gets to come. But all of you are here because you're dedicated to the same mission that the faculty are dedicated to of trying to uh, save the planet and trying to make sure we can live uh, good lives on this planet. And so what you just saw are five really stunning examples of the kind of work you're going to be doing for your entire career. So I want to congratulate you on getting to this point. We'll have other times for congratulations at different kinds of commencement activities and all the rest of that. Um, but I think this is, the, th this is the, time, the last time we really gather as a group to do substance. And what I saw today was a lot of very impressive substance. So congratulations to you. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with you uh, as your alumni. Thank you.